Hey there, thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then, let's do this. Seen a bunch of rundown new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the bow, and the five string melodies grooving. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep, beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, Please go to mybigfootsighting.com. My Bigfoot sighting started in 2018. I was getting myself together. I had been in the military for a few years, and I had just gotten back from Afghanistan. And I got back to Long Island, New York. And I, I was putting myself through different therapies for different things between addiction and PTSD. And I found myself not really comfortable with, you know, mainstream society. And I was looking for an alternative to being indoors every day. And there was these beautiful, beautiful woods nearby and, you know, interlocking trails and streams and different things like that in the immediate area. And I just said, you know, let me just go and embrace this. And I did that about every single day for five years, five or six years. And nothing was really out of the ordinary, at least nothing that I was soaking in. Now, one particular day I had been planning for a trip to the Pac West and I was starting to get an interest in Sasquatch and I didn't really know what to expect from them. I didn't know anything about a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot. I just knew that they intrigued me a little bit and I had always had this mindset of even since a child, there's got to be something else to this world. There has to be. Like, it can't just be nine to fives. It can't just be traffic. It can't just be politics and so on and so forth. And I would walk these woods and I, I would, similar to a child, because I didn't necessarily believe that I was going to see a Sasquatch in New York and especially on Long Island. But I did. And on this particular day, I, I had been like like a child pretending, you know, pretending almost like I was every day, almost like preparing myself. As a military guy, we know muscle memory, right? So you go and you do things over and over and over and over and over until it becomes kind of part of your part of you, if you will. And it becomes almost natural to the point where there's no faults. And so that's what I was doing. I was kind of practicing and creating a muscle memory for what I was going to do when I got out there. And it was just my little way to escape and get out of the everyday norm, if you will. Now, I bumped into a Sasquatch this particular day, and I, I don't know really how else to put it, because that's exactly how it happened. I was walking and just talking, and all of a sudden, this was the most unexpected thing I have ever, ever experienced in my life. And I did not know... Looking back, I, I don't think there was any thought process involved. And I'll just tell you exactly how it went down. It was just like any other day. I had been walking those trails for five, almost six years, every single day, every day for at least an hour or two and nothing. And then for a 10 foot thousand pound humanoid covered in hair to be within 20 feet of you is mind-blowing now i know a lot of people might not be familiar with what a sasquatch was but this is something that makes you i wasn't either and this is something that really makes you search for answers i believe at this point this is when people say i'm gonna move to the city or i need more answers and i'm gonna you know continue to go out there and find more it took me about two days of being a vegetable to say i need more answers now, backpedaling to the experience itself, I had been looking down and just kind of walking around and looking at my feet and looking at the floor, 
you know, panning around, looking at nature, so on and so forth. And as I panned back up from the ground, there was this giant just standing there. It was black, covered in hair, dark, dark hair, massive, muscular. It has like this gray kind of leathery type face for, uh, you know, skin showing. It was beautiful, honestly. It was, it was beautiful. His hair was flowing very fluidly is the best way I can describe it. It wasn't messy. Almost looked like if you could go to the best hairstylist ever, ever, and get a hair your hair done. That's that's how good it looked. Uh, it wasn't long. It was short hair, but but still very fluid. It all it all meshed into the other hair. And, and mind you, this is you know we're not talking about just hair on top of your head. This is hair covering the entire body. I don't remember seeing anything around its feet area. I, I kind of started at. Where, where you would normally look, eye level for a human is not eye level for them. And it was about double my size and height. And then <laughs> weight wise, it's just, I, I don't know. I say a thousand pounds, but that's just a guesstimate, right? It's hard to put an exact height and an exact weight on them. You have to look at different things like what they're standing on. If we're talking completely physical, what are they standing on? Where are they standing? Is it the same, you know, level as you? Because you're not standing in a, a cafeteria or, you know, something like that. You're, you're you're in the woods on different terrain. But, you know, give or take within a foot. It was about 10 foot and I, I'd range it at about a thousand pounds. Uh, his eyes were pretty black for the most part. I don't remember any real detail about the eyes. And mind you, I'll tell you how I reacted. As I panned up and saw it, I, I didn't take in too much detail because of the shock I went into. I looked up, and as as I panned up, and, and I guess I started to process what was going on, you know, it was all within a one, two-second period. My body reacted in the fight or flight. But I didn't run. I did. It, it reacted in flight mode, but I didn't run. I f chose flight straight to the ground. This was just my reaction. There was no thought process involved. I dropped to the ground. I curled in the field position. I started crying uncontrollably. I, I think I started yelling no, no, and pointing that way. I really want to be clear about the fact that there was nothing threatening. Just the sheer size was enough to send my whole world crashing. And I had been preparing, or so I thought. I thought I was. I was a soldier, and I was preparing for what I was going to do if and when I possibly saw a Sasquatch when I did this trip to the Pacific Northwest in the near future. And then it happened right there where it wasn't supposed to. And I didn't know anything about them. I had no idea. I only thought that they existed in the Pac West and BC Canada, things like that. I just had no idea. I had no clue about suburban Sasquatch. I had no idea. Mind you, Long Island of all places is it's not part of our culture here. There's there's nothing to prepare you for this. Down the line a little bit, I did realize that there were a lot of people that have had experiences and they were pretty public about it, but not too public. You know, there's just not enough that makes you want to just come out and talk about it. But I had to. It was my way of it was my way of dealing with it, I guess, and getting involved with other people. So this is my first Bigfoot sighting. So I thought. Backpedaling a little ways. I had thought about it. Later on, as I went more and more and more in depth into all this stuff, I had thought about these different times in my life where things didn't add up. There was two that really, really struck me. One was in South Korea, and one was right outside Fort Benning in Georgia. Both times I was in the military. 
the one at Fort Benning was in the middle of the night. I was with a buddy of mine. He was uh, my roommate. We lived together in Alabama, but we were on the Georgia side going in the front gate of Fort Benning. Now, if the front gate of Fort Benning it looks like a, a toll booth in the middle of the night in a big, big place. And you pull up to in, but there's a bunch of guys with rifles and things to that effect, right? Handguns, military police. So you don't really go up to that gate and, and mess around. You pull up, you have your hands at 10 and 2, you give them an ID card, and you hope you don't get messed with enough, and you go through the gate, and you move on. So at this particular evening, I stopped dead about 100 yards off from the gate because I seen something out of my driver's side window, and it was massive. I mean, massive. It was on all fours, and it was shaking the bushes and trees, and it was coming in and out of the tree line, and I, I could totally, totally tell that it was so out of place. And I'm stepping out of the truck now, and I'm pointing, and the guy I'm with, he's from Queens, New York, and he tells me, he confirms that he sees it too, but he's a little inebriated. So I'm like, I'm not really getting much out of him. So I'm really trying to process what's going on. But I'm also panning back and forth to the front gate because now I see them screaming and waving me on to come up. And so they start coming out to me, the military police. And I'm still pointing like, you, you, you don't understand what I'm looking at. You need to see this. You don't understand. And they're like, come on, come on, come on. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand what i'm looking at and it's at this point doing this figure eight movement it's this like it's the thing that people refer to as a spider crawl and uh, it's very it's very accurate it's, it's it move it's hard to see something that's so massive move in these in in these figure eight spider like movements I, I don't know how else to explain it but it was so fast and so fluid that it just was mind-blowing to the point where I, I refused to move I just had to keep pointing and they came to me eventually and said no it's just a bore they get really big you know it's Georgia you don't know what you're talking about just get in your truck pull through very military, like, like, get in your truck, soldier, like, blah, 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 get in your POV, go, 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 you know. And you do, you do what you're told for the most part. And uh, this was just something that, looking back, I do believe I saw a Sasquatch. I don't think that was a bore. I, I've processed it for a long time, and I really don't think I was looking at a Hogzilla at all. The other time in Korea was very, very quick. I was going to a, we were traveling a ways, uh, a group of people I was with, we were traveling a ways off, and I was on a bus, and we were traveling to a place called Everland. And it's like this theme park up in the mountains somewhere, and I, I don't really to this day know where it was or what, you know, how we got there, I can't really remember. There was... There were so many things that we did and traveled to and went all over and just kind of tried to experience different stuff. And I remember being on the bus and just having, you know, it was over overcrowded and I just kind of had like, I was trying to use my escape method and avoid the uncomfortable crowding of the bus. And I just kind of had my face up against the glass and was staring out the side window. The way Korea is set up is at least rural. They don't waste a inch of the land it comes right up to the road the rice paddies come right up to the road everything 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 comes right up to the street there's not like well manicured areas there's not gardens every inch is used and or every inch is not disturbed and on this particular occasion i saw something right out the window and i don't know if it crossed the road Prior to that, in front of us, or it came out of the bush and went back in. But what I saw was going really, really quickly into the brush. And it was, again, it was on all fours, but it was so massive 
And I remember as we drove by, seeing this thing kind of going in and out real quick and then going eventually in and disappearing. And for this massive, massive thing, whatever it was, in hindsight, I don't really know if it was Sasquatch or Dogman or maybe something I don't really know about necessarily yet. But for it to disappear into that bush, just it was like watching a giant just run into the brush, the low, low rice paddy brush, and then just disappear. Uh, again, I, there's not really much else to this story. I just drove by it, and I kind of remember just pointing and saying something and everyone just brushing me off. And, you know, you just kind of forget about it. You're not going to make a big scene. You're on the bus with a bunch of people that don't speak the same language as you, and, and you know, the few people you're with will kind of make fun of you if you bring it up. So I just remember kind of brushing it under the rug and forgetting about it. But as I learned more and more about what's really out there, old memories like that started to pop up and finally I addressed them and would say, Hey, I don't think I saw something normal that day. Backpedaling a little ways back to this original encounter I was talking about. <sighs> there was really nothing scary. I, I don't know if I touched on this yet, but there was nothing scary that happened. It did not show its teeth. It didn't roar at me. It didn't bluff charge me. It was just simply there. And the sheer size of it is what really, really scared me. But it wasn't enough for me to say that these things were threatening. You know, it was just my fear that kept me from really processing what was in front of me. And what was in front of me was beautiful. It was an anomaly. It was a eighth world wonder. And the way I treated it was not acceptable for me. So I continued to search. I've had a lot of experiences along the way. I've had a lot of uh, Bigfoot sightings along the way. I guess it depends what you categorize them as. I've learned that they're not strictly flesh and blood. Now, that's that's not necessarily to say that they're, there's not more answers out there than what I've found. I'm not that ignorant to say that I'm a small portion of what's got to be out there, right? But this other particular occasion I want to talk about is pretty amazing. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. And I was just hiking in one of these regular places that I, that I frequent. I call it the bamboo forest. There's just these two huge bamboo areas that don't belong in this area. I don't know how they got there, but I'm not complaining. And there's beautiful, beautiful trails that you can hike in. They're just regular woods, but on the edge of each side, there's this huge bamboo forest, probably about a dozen acres, maybe. I mean, I, I, give or take, I'm not exactly sure. I'm just guessing. But on each side. I had hiked these trails multiple, multiple times before and just enjoyed it in general. I would normally come in up to this point and I'd come across this huge field and then enter the woods. And as I would come through the trail, it would it would wind in and then it comes to a fork. If you go left, you hit the first bamboo forest section. And then if you go right, it winds through and then you hit the other bamboo forest section, which was more appealing to me for the most part because it was more wide open. It was just nice. It was like you could go in there and you could breathe because there's a little trail that goes through the middle. It was just really enjoyable. Not like the one on the other side. You have to go and go off trail and you have to kind of bushwhack to get there and you get cut up by thorns. And then when you get inside it, there's really no way to get through. There's all this interlocking, interweaving, bent and broken and all these different bamboo all over the place there's actually a teepee in there which is kind of odd made of bamboo which is to this day i still don't know what did that or why it would be done but it's interesting so on this particular day i went that way and as i came through i passed by i went in there i went in the bamboo section 
and there was some weird stuff that I hadn't seen before. Like, uh, it looked like there was an Alice in Wonderland doorknob in there and just some things that were just really, really off. Nothing out of the norm that would really throw me off though, or take me off my game. So eventually I backpedaled to the trail and I came up the hill and it's really nice. There's a few houses, uh, with huge property. I think one is a farm. So I'm not really thinking too much about it. You know, I'm still pretty near suburbia at this point or rural area, if you will. And I come back around and I come down the hill and I have my camera out because I'm videoing and just like another normal day, I'm just kind of talking to the camera and processing what I'm seeing. And I come down this hill, and about halfway down the hill, I pan to my right, and there is this, it doesn't belong, it, it's this massive, massive white head, and it's just staring at me, if it's even staring at me, but it's looking in my direction, and when I lock eyes with it, its eyes were these giant, giant black sockets. The inside of those eyes were dancing. Lights were flickering and dancing different colors. It was going between blues and purples and reds, almost as if it was like blue and red, but it would also do a mix of the two. I, I don't know how to explain that to this day. I don't know if I ever will, but I do believe I was looking at a white Sasquatch. So I, I'm looking at this white Sasquatch, and I don't really know how this occurred. There's so many different possibilities and ways you can address this. I'll leave it up to your beliefs and your understandings when it comes to the Bigfoot. but. I turned away, and mind you, this was the most massive thing you've ever seen. And I turned away for a brief second, and when I turned back to look, it had disappeared completely, without a sound, without a trace. This is just like the first experience I had, where I dropped to the ground in the fetal position. I was screaming and crying, and, and mind you, all that happened in seconds, and when I looked back up without a trace, that Sasquatch had disappeared as well. I don't want to pretend like I have all the answers, because I don't. There's a, some understanding that I've gained over the years, but I don't have all the answers, and I'm not going to force anything that I've learned on anybody else, but that is one thing that I have learned, is that at least for a fact, they can just disappear on you without making a sound. Another experience I had was I had been pretty much working Long Island, uh, the eastern end, for quite a while now. And I wanted to try to challenge myself and expand. So I started to go up to the mountains in the Catskills of New York and even the Adirondacks at times, too different areas and I, I really wanted to start deepening my understanding and seeing what they looked like in different areas so i started to work my way up to the mountains and do different things and one of the things i started to do was i started to camp and i started to go camping solo and i learned to i i started doing it in the pine barrens of long island i started out there working my way into what I needed to make it through the night and this and that, and just kind of practicing, if you will. And people laugh at me when I say that, but the last thing you want to do is end up in the middle of nowhere with not enough of what you need. So what I would do is just kind of go to a campgrounds and, you know, get a, again, it's muscle memory, right? You get, you get an understanding of everything you need so that when you get out there in these high pressure situations or 
uh, situations where you don't have that ability to just go and grab something. You're prepared. And you don't want to be underprepared for this kind of stuff because you leave too many variables. And if the way I look at it is if I'm worried about how much firewood I have or if I'm going to freeze tonight or if I'm this or that's going to happen one way or another, I'm going to start to get outside of the proper mindset I want to have to set myself up for an experience. So what I did was I started going out into the mountains. And on this particular occasion, I said, no, let me grab one of my team and see if they want to go out. And uh, it, it ended up being one guy out of the 12 up there. And he came with me and he was like, oh, I've never been here. This place is great. It was this beautiful, beautiful place. It was called Overlook Mountain. It's near Woodstock, New York. It's at the very, very top of this I mean, gorgeous, gorgeous area. And you get to the top and there's this huge monk retreat and monastery, I believe it's called. And at the edge of that is this beautiful, beautiful trails. And you can park at the top and go up this very, very hefty incline to get to the overlook. Or you can work the trails at that particular parking lot. But what a lot of people don't know is if you ignore that original, oh, my God, look at this place. And you go back round down the hill, there's this lower lot. And down there, there's a place called Magic Meadow. And it's gorgeous. And locals and people like myself that know about it will go down there and go camping in it. So kind of when everybody's gone for the day and, you know, you put up your stuff and you go out there. So on this particular time, I said, all right, I'll, I'll go out there ahead of time and I'll set everything up. I walked around and I, I was getting a good feeling about the place. Like I always do. And I said, you know, I think tonight's the night I'm going to put up the tents. We'll get, you know, maybe we'll get something good. And uh, I wasn't really sure what to make of it. I had never been out there overnight, but I had, I was optimistic. and. I started setting up and next thing you know, he arrived and he was very enthralled with the place and it's gorgeous. You walk across this bridge and there's this beautiful flowing creek and then you come up through these woods and, you know, just up the hill is this, it opens up into this meadow and it's gorgeous and there's this beautiful, beautiful view of the mountains and Long story short, we were expecting some rain, so I said, you know what, I'm going to put it under the canopy just at the edge of the of the meadow. So I did that. We set up camp, light some fires, get everything going, and at this particular time, I had got this like feeling like that we weren't alone. And he says to me, too, the same thing. He says, yeah, I could feel it. I could feel it. I said, okay, all right. So I said, I got a good feeling about tonight. It's going to be pretty active. And this particular occasion, we waited for dark. We had a good time. We were just chopping it up and hanging out. And dark came pretty fast. And by the time we were done setting up, dark came pretty fast. And there wasn't a lot going on. Not too much. I had left some things around for them. And I said, you know what, let me see if I can entice something. So at this point, it's pitch black. I mean, it is pitch black. You can't see anything. You, there's nothing. There's no sound. You're just, you could see as far as the fire goes. I have this little uh, plan where I, I, I make like three fires so that there'll be one at the edge of camp. And then there's one that just smokes a lot because that's good for the bugs. And then I have one that's just the main fire for the main, you know, main lighting area. So I had taken an apple. I said, let's see if we can entice them. And the Sasquatch I'm talking about in particular. And I said, I'm just going to throw this out there and see what happens. And I took the apple and I just threw it out into the darkness. And you heard it hit a tree out in the darkness. You heard it, boom. And, it, you know, it broke like a rig, you know, an apple would against a tree. And before we could even kind of giggle about the sound it made, we started to, you know, and boom, boom, right next to both our feet, a rock landed right in front of us. 
right then and there, we knew we weren't alone for sure. You know, for sure. At this point, my attention is really peaked and my interest is really peaked. I said, okay, I'm not going to throw nothing back out there. Uh, I don't know if that upset you or what, but let's just be more respectful and more courteous and let you guys come to us. You're obviously out there. We started to be patient and just kind of sit and talk and do a little singing and things like that and express our gratitude towards them and letting us stay in their home, etc. When you're in that place where you're in the middle of the woods or the forest or wherever you are, where we were was wasn't super, super remote as far as there not being a road nearby. Our car was probably a quarter or a half mile off, so it wasn't too, too scary, but it was enough where you're in the middle of the dark and you're not near anything and you just feel like the fishbowl. You know, when you if you have a fish tank in your house and you you have all your lights off, but your fish tank light is on, that's what it feels like. It's the best way I can describe it is you're in somebody else's home and you have yourself self-illuminated like you're in a fish tank. And once in a while, the Bigfoot come by and tap the glass like, hey, hey, hey. And that's just what it feels like. And on this night, we chose to be the fish, right? It's the best experiment I could think of, at least. And and to be humble and respectful and just kind of show up and just say, hey, Whatever you want to show me, you could show me. We started to hear voices at this point. My friend Ian decided to gift. He felt like there was young ones around, so he decided to gift some snacks like Twizzlers and things like that. And right where he had gifted them, we could hear these voices. The best way I could describe it was Fraggle Rock. And I said this to him. I said, it sounds like Fraggle Rock. And I remember he kind of laughed about it, whatever. I didn't know at the time that he didn't know what Freckle Rock was. And I didn't really even know what it was. Like, I remember it from a child, but I didn't really, I didn't really watch it or anything. So I kind of, I kind of just subconsciously, I guess, went to somewhere to find an analogy. But he did. He says, you know, when I went out the next day and looked up Fraggle Rock, he said, you're absolutely right. That's exactly what it sounded like. Where I want to go with this is there was two of us there and we were having similar experiences up to this point. I started to get this inkling that they were going to somehow put me into like a sleep state, like a really, really good sleep state. And they were going to interact with Ian. I couldn't really understand why. And I didn't really know what to make of it, but I don't sleep well when I'm camping, especially in a new place like that. When I'm out remotely like that, I don't sleep well at all, at all. I'm up and down if I'm even asleep at all, because my ears are always open. You hear something in the night and it really makes you kind of, what was that? What was that? Right. You're not at home in your bed with your walls around you. It's not warm or it's not cool, whether it's summer or winter. It's a very, very uncomfortable type of sleep. But I remember saying to myself, well, what's this all about? So I wandered off. He was in his tent and I wandered off. And I said, let me just go and kind of tune in with the forest and see what this is about and make sure. Because I have somebody with me and I can't afford to be off my game. I need to be on point. I felt very, very responsible. Whenever I bring somebody in the woods, I feel very, very responsible for them. And it's almost like it's not about disappointing them with the experience. It's about keeping them safe. So I walked off. I walked out into the dark where it was uncomfortable for me, but I knew I would be able to really tune in and see what was going on. And I heard these what sounded like owl calls. But they were very off-brand. You might say, how do you know an owl is an owl, right? Like, how do you know if you can't see anything? And how do you know if for sure? And I don't have a necessarily good answer for that uh, as far as the normal ways of thinking. I very much just tune in 
uh, on a deeper level than the five senses that were given, you know, at birth. So I was listening. I heard these owl calls. And I said to them, hey, can you please be kind to us tonight? He's new to this. Can you go easy on him if you're going to put me under or or put me in some kind of sleep state? And I was very uncomfortable with this. You know, I was I was very worried that he was just going to go through things and I wouldn't be there for him. And that was really what was bothering me. Not like, you know, getting extra sleep, right? That doesn't bother anybody. But it was just very, it was something very, very new to me that I had never, never experienced. And at this point is when I had another Bigfoot sighting. I don't think I've ever spoken about this before. At the edge of my light, I could see these faces emerge. They were different sizes. There was two, possibly three. I don't want to say small because they were larger than I was. There was one that was bigger than the other two and possibly three. And they were just at the edge of my light. And they were, they were big. The smaller ones that were larger than me were probably around six to seven, seven foot. And the other one was about a foot or a foot and a half larger than they were. The larger one looked wrinkly, if you will. Like I've, like the leathery face I was talking about earlier was like very tight like it was just like a smooth leather jacket this particular face of this particular sasquatch had wrinkles to it almost almost like a baseball glove it has like knit over it right and all i could think of that was that this was an old old bigfoot it was an old old sasquatch and i couldn't get a great look at it but i got the inkling that it was a female maybe a very old female and that maybe these were her grandkids. Now mind you, this is speculation, but I'm just going off what the vibe felt like. And that will double back to sight. I never got a good look at the kids or the younger ones. I should say the smaller ones. I didn't ever see their face in detail. I don't know if that's something cultural or something that I'm, you know, wasn't supposed to be privy to, or it was just because they were at the edge of darkness. That's that's up to you to decide. I, I could just kind of tell you what happened. And it was like I got this sense of, just by looking at her, that I got this sense of, hey, everything's going to be okay. You're just going to sleep good tonight. And everything will be fine. We'll take care of it. You might ask yourself, how do you trust that? Well, I don't know. I really, at this point, it's really just a trust based respect and an understanding. In my opinion, I go in those woods every single day, different places all the time. If something wanted to hurt me, it would have and could have done it already. It could have toyed with me any which way it chose to, but they don't. They choose to show me respect and love and that's what i give in return so i'm going to double back and say that i went to the camp and i talked to ian about it and while he was very nervous about what i was telling him i said look i don't i don't know what to tell you but i i got a feeling i'm going to be knocked out tonight and uh you know, it's going to be a little a little crazy for you, but you might have some experiences. And uh, he said, OK, OK. And we both went to bed pretty soon after that. And again, I'll tell you this, I don't sleep well at all. And I remember him waking me up uh, sometime around sunrise or something to that effect. And he was waking me up in the middle of the night asking me, do you see that? Do you hear that? Do you, you know, and he was having a lot of experiences of his own that I won't touch on because I don't know if I should speak for him. But there was a lot of stuff going on throughout the night. And I slept. I did. I ended up sleeping through it all. There was a lot going on out there. And 
when we woke up, I remember him just saying like, man, like, I don't know how you slept through all that. And I said, I don't know either. <laughs> but again, I just, I, I just enjoy it. I really enjoy it. And there's uh, so many different things to embrace out there. And you never really know what you're going to get, right? You don't know what you're going to get or what you're going to see or what you're going to experience. But when it comes to this kind of stuff, you could just almost bet that it's going to be something you're not ready for. Maybe something uncomfortable, maybe something scary. But at the end of the day, you just kind of got to process it. And I love what I do. And I love all these Bigfoot sightings that I've had. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves and the plow And the five-string melodies groove in With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah The sound of a memory brings me back To the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track It's become and it been through it through the day on scrugs and skags Booking their bells to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it When I hear the front porch breaking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Summit on the backwards, backwards and double time Looking at the soul in the tremor Look at Kentucky style There's all the air Sweet tea, got the sound.